Well, Oregon lost out on five-star linebacker Justin Williams to Georgia, and now the prospect of them landing any five-star in 2024, it's, the chances are not zero, but they're dwindling a little bit. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today, being a recruiting show, is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the official recruiting sponsor here at the Locked On Network. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Brian Smith, our Locked On Recruiting Insider, is indeed here to talk about Justin Williams, a bevy of other five stars, and much, much more on the recruiting front, which is indeed a little bit quiet, uh, compared to some other points throughout the summer, Brian, but that can always change in, in an instant here. But off the top, I wanted to ask you about Justin Williams, and I, I think there were a lot of Oregon fans out there, understandably, disappointed that they didn't land this kid. Would have boosted Oregon's recruiting rating is also, because it can get easy to get lost in the weeds, I always feel obligated to point out, a really talented player who can transform your defense would have been that sort of guy. They do have Kamar Mathudi and Dylan Williams in there, but... There were some Oregon fans saying, oh, it's another miss. It's just, I, and, and to me, it didn't land the same as not getting Elijah rushing because you lost it to, to Georgia. That's not really a miss, right? Yeah, I, I tell people all the time, they don't like it. I'll say, well, who, who's this kid looking at? And they'll mention schools, and I don't pay attention, don't pay attention. When they say Georgia, I pay attention. It's just a school you're not going to beat very often if they want a kid. They have more cachet than anybody else in college football by a landslide. So they just won two national titles. It's hard. With that being stated, it's not like Dan Lanning, A, is going to give up on recruiting the kid, and B, they're still in on some other five stars. Be patient. Uh, I say that a lot, too, and recruiting is a marathon, not a sprint. So, yeah, but losing a kid to Georgia, I mean, gosh, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's not – It's not. The same as, you know, losing out on a kid to Arizona. And look, I, I've, I've talked about on the show that I understand, you know, a number of the reasons why rushing might have looked at Arizona and said, that's why I want to go to school. It's, of course, in his hometown. He's probably got a path to playing sooner over there compared to what he'd have at, at Oregon, given the strength of the defensive line recruiting class that Oregon had in 2023. But you know they're they're definitely different for for sure. I was more disappointed about rushing than uh, than, than Williams, but. As Oregon looks to continue to bolster the recruiting class, Brian, I mean, they already have a bunch of blue chippers, all of whom are four-star recruits. doesn't seem like there are any guys who could, you know, pull a jury on Dickey and uh, garner five-star status as as time goes. I suppose, every, just real quick on that, is, is any four-star recruit one great senior season away from getting bumped up? Oh, that's always something that can happen. It happens quite frequently. It goes both directions. Guys lose their fifth star, too. So Mateo you know, lost his. Yeah, I mean, like, there are probably a lot of reasons with that one. I mean, it, it's a whole other animal. But it's part of it, man, the, the little idiosyncrasies that go on with how you act off the field, the people around you, all that stuff, because there's 50 kids for, like, 25 spots. Somebody can't be there. It's just math. So... Yeah, any little thing that goes wrong they can ding you for, they will. It's pretty much like the NFL draft. Not everybody goes in the top five. That doesn't mean you have top five talent, but there's only so many spots. Yeah. Right. So no rushing, no Williams, but there are still other five stars that are in the mix uh, for, for Oregon in the 2024 recruiting cycle. And, and look, another thing that is important to point out is, are these kids talented when they're five stars? Yes. Are they mega talented oftentimes yes do i want to have them in every recruiting class yes but can you also have a high school recruiting class of great players and not have a single five star in them yeah you can you can have that as well but i think these are the sorts of players that you want to stack up particularly on the defensive side of the ball if you want to build you know the best defense that that you possibly can but let, let, let's move on to you know what other options are are out there 
for for the Ducks. But just kind of big picture first, Brian, you you told me before we hopped on to record that you were starting to get the sense that they might not land a single five star recruit in in the 2024 cycle, which would be something that I'd react to at the time uh, if if it does indeed come to happen. But why do you feel like you're getting that sense? So many of the kids that they're after, it's just insane recruitments. You look, I was kind of going through some of the lists today and Oregon's in on a lot of these kids. It's just every one of them, it's got either Texas or Georgia or Alabama or something like that. It's next to it. Their best shot will always be Seattle to San Diego. Those kids, it's just easier. They're more familiar with Oregon. So Baker, for instance, we were talking about him. I think he's a great shot. Aiden Breland, guys like that. There's possibilities anywhere in the California area in particular. Not a newsflash. But they've put their foot forward so many times in the last 10 years as a program, Baltimore, Philadelphia, the middle of frickin' Florida, Georgia, Alabama, that it's just random with them. It is by far the most difficult school in the country to predict who they're going to get, Oregon, by far, because it's so remote. I've never even been to the state. How in the heck am I going to talk about what their visits are like? I don't know. But it, it's very popular with a lot of the Florida kids I know. But it, I just – all these recruitments, though, there's none of them. I'm like, well, they're the definitive leader. By now, you would like to say that. They're just in on everybody. It's hard to pick which one it would be. So that gives me pause. So one name that, that's been tied to Oregon for quite some time, but there are certainly other teams that are in the mix, understandably so, for the number one offensive tackle in any given recruiting cycle. He's going to have an offer list that is uh, <laughs> rather long and competitive. Yeah, Mr. Baker. Um, Brandon um, Baker, for those yeah, who don't know. Yeah, I, I call him Mr. Baker because he's earned it. He is a technician. He is massive. He plays at modern day. He's gone against Trinity League competition. He's a kid we've known about for a long time. All the boxes are checked. As I always tell you on this podcast, USC makes me nervous with any kid from that school because they, that's their home base. But they haven't recruited it as well lately. Is it going to be AM or is it going to be Oklahoma or is it going to be some other? What other schools? A lot of the California kids are leaving now. And I don't really know the whole reason for it. I'm surprised that Lincoln Raleigh hasn't done better with that area. But which school is it that Oregon's going to compete with once we get to about October? I don't even care right now because he can go to whatever school. He can pick up the phone and go wherever he wants. Ohio State's been rumored with him, et cetera. I just don't care. Now I need to see what visits does Baker take? between like September 1st and about October 10th, 15th on his own to like, where am I just going to go for a visit? That'll probably tell me more than anything else. And he's a plug and play kid for some schools. I don't know if you plug and play at Oregon, that's hard, but he would at least compete and he can play guard or tackle before anybody asks. Yes, he can play both. doesn't really matter. Uh, matter of fact, that's something that Saban does really good tackle. So put him at guard as a freshman to get him their feet wet then deal with those edge rushers in the SEC as a sophomore, junior. Maybe that's what they do at Oregon if they get him, but uh, I don't know where he's going to visit yet. I need to see that list. So that, that was something that a couple of listeners wanted me to, to ask you about is, as you look at Oregon's tackle room potentially in 2024, Josh Connerly will still be there, will probably be the left tackle. But a Johnny Cornelius is a guy who was a highly coveted transfer portal recruit for the Ducks coming from FCS program, uh, an FCS program in Rhode Island this season. And he has two years of eligibility. And if he's starting at one tackle and Connerly is at the other, that would leave, you know, somebody to come in and be slated as the odd man out. But do you think that alters Baker's recruitment at all, whether or not he wants to play tackle or his willingness to play guard for a season and then move to tackle? Or how do, how do you see that kind of playing out for the Ducks as they go after that kid? Because like you said, every school is going to be after him. And would one school be willing to come in and say, hey, we're going to you, offer you starting left tackle as a true freshman, whereas Oregon most likely cannot offer that? They're not going to tell him that, number one. And I doubt very many schools are going to say you're going to start as a freshman at left tackle. If they do, Baker should not go to that school. That is a terrible recruiting pitch because – Putting any true freshman in a power five left tackle spot is asking for trouble. Panay Outside Sewell, of I, I, ju I, I just I, I just have to say Panay Sewell did it with a lot of success at Oregon. Yeah, but he's probably but you're, he's more the exception than the rule. No, oh, there's two or three a decade that really deserve to do it at any school. 
So the best offensive tackle I've seen in college football is Orlando Pace. I don't know if I'll see another one is that good. Again, he was he started day one on the best offensive line in college football. I mean, that's ridiculous. But outside of guys like him and Sewell, there's only a handful. Most of these kids also, I can guarantee you, without even knowing Baker, he's not going to be afraid of some transfer from Delaware or wherever the hell it is. He's not going to care. And he'll find his niche and he'll play some. As a sophomore, he would start Oregon, Alabama, Texas, doesn't matter. Uh, Ohio State, whatever. He, his list is ridiculous. It's all over the country. He's not going to sit long. He knows that. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair question to to ask, though. But it's, you know, a good comparison is Josh Connerly, who was the number one offensive tackle, who did not start anywhere along the offensive line for the Ducks sure. last year and now projects probably as our starting left tackle heading into this fall. We have more five stars to talk about because there are a lot of players that Oregon is after. But these days, every new new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business, just like recruiting. Big-time high stakes, and you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes. Add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to let people know that you're hiring and spread the word. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All righty, we got our second segment sip down the hatch and we're ready to keep things going. So let's shift to the defensive side of the ball where Oregon's got plenty of talented recruits. You know, Ifeo Badegwu is uh, one of the higher rated players in the 2024 cycle. He's a corner. They've got Aaron Flowers, the safety, their defensive linemen that are in the mix as well. But a five-star defensive lineman, I think, would do quite a bit given what Oregon is going to be losing uh, this season. Now they have a lot of talented players from 2023 who will hopefully be ready to contribute in their redshirt freshman or or sophomore seasons. But one guy that, uh, well, a couple guys that, that we've talked about before here on the show, Brian, Williams Nwaneri and Aiden Breland. Let's start with Breland, who is at modern day, same high school as Brandon Baker. And it's it's crazy to think that those guys are teammates <laughs> right now. It, it, it's, I mean, that's just a modern day special, isn't it? To have a five-star offensive lineman and a five-star defensive lineman on the, on the same team, like that's, that's very uncommon. They have arguably the best running back in 24 and 25 on their team. And, oh, yeah, they have Nate Frazier too, right? The, the junior is probably better. Who's the junior? I, I forget his name, but I saw him at Under Armour in, Orla- in uh, Bradenton. It's ridiculous. Some places are just are just built differently, I suppose. Well, I mean, it's the Trinity League and all those private schools recruit. They can deny it all they want. But all the kids oh, yeah. from the inner city now all head there and all the other outskirts head there, too. And this just in, there's about 20 million people in the greater L.A. area. It's not hard to find some ball players, and they've got great coaching. So if you do that, they will come. Yeah. But well, let's start with Breland, a guy who I would absolutely love for Oregon to, to pick up, not saying that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm opposed to getting Baker, of course, but I mean, for me, when I look at <laughs> Oregon's roster and the, you know, recruiting priorities they should have, I, I would say Breland would need to be a higher priority than, uh, than Baker per se. But if you can get both, hey, that would be uh, fantastic. Get one and then, you know, have him make the recruiting pitch to his teammate. Hey, they told me this is Oregon. Hey, they're saying this. This thing's all really, really great. So, Long-winded way of asking, Brian, what is the latest on Aiden Breland? Last I heard is A&M and Miami visits coming up. Uh, then we'll go into the season. That's about it. They, you know, these barbecues and all these things, he's going to both of theirs. Where he ends up in the fall, again, just like with Baker, that's what I'm more interested in. Those are high pitch, high stakes because it's game day visits. And like we've discussed before, when a kid visits Outson Stadium, I mean, it's not it's not real hard to sell. Outson Stadium is incredible. Uh, you can hear it from miles away through the TV. So I'm sure they're going to have a pretty good success rate. But they need to get him there early in the season. I don't even know their schedule, but one of those early season games, 
he needs to be at Oregon. If he does not, then I would worry very much that he's not going there. So has he been on campus previously, or has he not been up to Eugene just yet? I think he's been up. I think about the entire state of California has been up there, it seems like. It, the L.A. area, they do a tremendous job of recruiting. I don't even look anymore. By this point, an elite kid like that, he's been up there. Gotcha. So I would say just thinking about Oregon's schedule, you have three home games in the first four weeks. The first one is against Portland State week one. You've got Hawaii week three. I would look at maybe Colorado week four. 100% because there'll be a lot of – just because of Dion. Yeah, because I mean, then the next be. home game doesn't actually come for a while because then they go at Stanford uh, – or it might be Stanford that Colorado. But regardless, Colorado's in there, but then it's a bye, and then they're at Washington. So I think the best early right. ch- or early chance to get All a right. visit for, for Breland would probably be that Colorado game where – You know, I know the Buffs are much improved with their roster and the overall talent from a year ago, but hopefully at home against a team that has a three and a half win total, according to FanDuel Sportsbook, we're able to put up a good defensive showing that that week. That's what that's what you're making a face at uh, at Colorado three and a half. You think that's too low, too high, too high. Brian is low on the Buffs. I think three and a half is if you're setting a win total, I think it's about right. I, I think that's. I think they'll win two or three games. Their schedule is not very friendly. They open with TCU. No, yeah, their schedule is tough. But see that. But see that's that's the interesting thing. Not to turn this into a Colorado show, but people don't always factor in win totals with schedules. If you gave Colorado UCLA's schedule, I bet their win total would be at least four and a half, maybe five. Yeah, it's who you play, and it's who you don't play. Yeah, it's who it's they, who you but don't. They caught play. all the wrong teams. Yes, ab- absolutely. They've got two Power Five opponents, one of which the reigning you know national runners up in TCU. I don't see them uh, doing anything along that front. But hopefully, Oregon can do something on either Breland or another name to watch: Williams Winery, number one overall defensive lineman. Depending on which recruiting service you look at, out of the Kansas City, Missouri area, Oregon has you know been on the prowl, shall we say, to to try and get him to one day choose the Ducks. Does he have any sort of timeline? Is he a, you know, early signing window kind of kid? Will he commit in the fall? And also, where do you think Oregon stands right now? They've got him coming in. I believe it's for the game against the Buffs. That's the only thing. Until then, I Oregon's in as good a spot as it gets. You have to get that kid on campus. I mean, obviously, we've talked about this on this show before. Dan is from the greater Kansas City area. Where's Maneri from? The greater Kansas City area. He's got connections there. That is an Oklahoma, Georgia, Oregon battle, maybe Missouri, but it's going to be one of those four. Um, I, I always say it. I never like it when Georgia's involved with a recruit. It's always bad. That's, that's look, people can throw rocks all they want, but it's just true. They don't, especially for defensive recruits, man, it's hard to turn down Georgia. I get it. And I have no interest in Georgia at all as a fan, but that that one's the that's the school that worries me. Yeah, and, and he does have that visit scheduled according to twenty four seven sports uh for September twenty third, which is uh the Colorado game at home and then Stanford is the following week. And look, that that could end up being, it looks like, kind of a big visit weekend for it has the Ducks. to be based on what you said about their schedule it yeah has because to. they go they go at stanford the following week then they have a bye then they're at washington so their next game in eugene won't be for 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 another month they're gonna have a one month gap where they won't play a game at, really at, at Autzen stadium it it is it's logical from the pac-12 standpoint though because oh boy you, well because you have them play colorado <laughs> as the first conference game Oregon, a big brand, Dion, a massive brand. So starting conference play with that is one of your headliner games. Like that's going to get people to watch. But then you give them the Stanford game the following week because you go home and then on the road. But then you give them the bye before they play Washington. And then Washington also has a bye before that game. And that could allow the you know potential media machine to just kind of ramp up the hype for that Washington game and potentially make it college game day. Because you could have two teams going into that game undefeated. Uh, That's not a guarantee because we have to beat Texas Tech and Washington has to beat Michigan State, and both those games are on the road. But both teams are capable of doing that. And if they hold their own against everybody else, I think that's what the Pac-12 is kind of thinking there. But I honestly, until this moment, hadn't even really realized that there will be a one-month gap where no football is played at at Austin Stadium. But 
then it kind of gets uh, heavier there as as the time as as time goes on and such. But uh, another thing that I want to ask you about, Brian. This is a mailbag question that came in. All of you listening or watching can always be part of the mailbag YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. This is kind of going back to the, the Justin Williams, Elijah rushing conversations and such. Uh, he says, hey, Spencer, one of your everyday guys here. In your opinion, what can the Oregon staff do to get over that hump of not getting the five-star players, specifically to 2024, of course? How do we get to the Georgia status? Thanks for the great show. Keep it up. Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, one of them is something they'll never get, and that's location. Yeah. It's just flat out. Like, if you look at the college football playoff that started in 14 and moved forward, which schools go? It's the same ones over and over. Where are they located? Where all the freaking D linemen and corners are. Right down here where I live. Florida, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, that area. It's where they all are. So that's a problem. Number two, though, is something they showed last year really quickly, and that's development. When Kirby took over at Georgia, he hired Lanning, all these different guys. You keep hiring the right people and you develop your players, you send them to the NFL. They start, I mean, it took Georgia forever to break through, then they won the last two. It's not an overnight process. Develop, develop, develop. He started getting better and better recruits after he showed he could put guys in the NFL. That process never changes. Do you think Dan doesn't know that? I mean, I'm, he probably talks to Kirby all the time. It's just something they're going to have to do and get through. And I think with the, that D-line class, that is, what was it, 10 guys? Or what? It's one of the craziest numbers I've ever seen in one class, by I the think way. It was, I think it was 10. I've never seen that before for anybody, but it's, it's a massive number. Anyway, Georgia, Alabama, et cetera, they, oh, they get all the five. They developed three-star guys, too. Saban's first class that kind of came through that 2009 title, his star defensive player was a three-star kid nobody wanted out of Tampa. He developed him. You got to have a couple of hits like that to get to the five stars. That's Lanning's main project. Develop, develop, develop. He's not going to get all the kids like a certain young man from Tucson or Williams, et cetera. He's gonna, he'll get a few, but the percentage will be low for a while. It is what it is. But if you don't get in the race, you never were going to win the race either. Don't bitch at him for missing. Bitch at him if he's not at least in the game at the end. Not the other way around. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And by the way, there are 11 players by my count in the 2023 class for from the high school ranks that are either edge players or or defensive linemen. So they're That's very much very much bulking up uh, as as much as they can and getting those sorts of guys. And uh, you just you, you want to continue to add add talent anywhere and everywhere you can in every recruiting class. You never know who's going to transfer out. You never know who's going to pop. You never know who's going to get injured. There are a myriad of reasons as as to why. Another another five star before we kind of put a bow on that conversation for today's show, Brian, that I, I've just heard some mild, mild rumblings, shall we say, is Jordan Ross. He's a five star edge prospect from down in, in the Alabama area. I believe he is not someone that Oregon is necessarily majorly in the running for. But what I've heard is that they're not completely out because Jordan Ross isn't completely in anywhere if if that makes sense like Oregon has a shot because he's not you know solely focused on one school or, or down to a couple schools necessarily the two schools that I've heard the most but it's still a long way off are not going to surprise you Alabama and Florida shocker yeah I know I mean he's look for those that don't know Tuscaloosa is 45 minutes from Birmingham it again if you did a footprint of where like top say two rounds NFL draft where the D linemen come from where I live is going to be red. It's on fire. And it's right through there is a plus Birmingham to Atlanta is like a plus. It's the best in the country. That's why they win. They're all right there. You have to find a way to get those kids and it's not going to be friendly to do it. If you don't get them though, they go to the same schools over and over like we've had and you get a repeat. There are three schools getting all these kids. you sound familiar. Clemson, Alabama, and Georgia. What do those three schools usually end up at the end of the season? The college football playoffs. It's just the way it is, man. That's just where these kids come from. And until somebody kind of breaks through and starts mixing that up, Tennessee, Auburn's kind of recruiting well again, Florida, et cetera, you're going to have the same schools in the playoff over and over because my dead grandmother can coach the defensive front for these schools. It's ridiculous. So maybe, maybe Oregon kind of changes that because a few of the kids down here have made some unusual picks in the last year or two. 
Uh, one of the kids just picked Florida from Mississippi that nobody thought they were even close with. Kids are just starting to kind of go different spots. Michigan got a kid, et cetera. It's random. Maybe it's Oregon's turn because this could come into play. I know they just got 10 kids or whatever. George Ross going to come in and play. He's right. If you had to take a guess right now, how many five stars Oregon ends up landing in 2024? What would your best guess be right now, today, July 27th? One. One? That's, I mean, that's kind of par for the course, to be honest. Yeah. One. Yeah. I, 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 I think two is probably, I think three is like the absolute max. Everything goes perfect. I think one to two is, is, pretty likely i don't think we know and we'll just have to keep following this sort of stuff and and of course we always will as to which kid it could be whether it be breland or baker if they baker got both of them pick. breland would be baker 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 baker'd be a pick but anyway that's continuing to evolve last thing for today's show brian is what exactly this is another question that came in in the age of the transfer portal what exactly is the value to high school recruiting? And I, I understand people who say, well, you know, high school recruiting, I think it's more of a knee jerk reaction to not getting, you know, a pair of five star recruits that Oregon was definitely after and would have liked to have had both the coaching staff and the fans like we all would have liked to have had those guys didn't get them. I feel like it's closer to that. But I do think there is some legitimacy to the idea of, oh, you know, high school recruiting is not as important now. But I, I still feel like the best schools and the best programs are still doing it at a high level. They're still putting money into it. They're still putting effort behind it. They still want to get these kids. I, I look at the portal and say it's, an, it's a way to more readily fill needs and gaps. But I still think the core of your roster is built through the high school recruiting class. Brian likes that response. That is the best answer you've given on this show. That is the best answer. I'll take by that. Far. I'll take and, that. I think that was pretty. I think that was pretty good. And here's why: don't make it complex. What does Alabama, Ohio State, and Georgia do? They sign the elite players and they say, "Screw the transfer portal." Are they suffering right now? Not exactly. The discussion just ended. The elite teams <laughs> yeah. go the high school route. They develop their players. And they kick the you know what out of everybody. That's the teams that are taking 15 plus kids out of the portal. You know why? They suck. That's just the way it is. There are a few exceptions where they had a gazillion kids turn pro. Like LSU has the highest rate over the last 20 years of juniors leaving. It just, you know, it just is what it is. So if they have a year that's a little higher somewhere around, whatever. But they can recruit 15 kids from inside the state of Louisiana every year and have a top five class. It's ridiculous. Again, it's just one of those states. But there are very few schools that are going to take more than six to eight kids. Once you get past that number, you're in the uh-oh zone. We missed in recruiting. Well, we had too many injuries, whatever it is. Or, or, or the other thing that I thought of is if you're adding so many transfers, and you're going to see more on average for the top programs than you used to, but if you're adding so many where it's 25, 30, or you know, Colorado 50 kids, it's oftentimes you're undergoing a coaching change and you don't have, you don't, you don't have players on the roster. Unfortunately, I mean, I hate saying it like this, but there's no nice way. Too many kids are soft as Charmin and they just give up. If I'm not starting, I'm going to leave. Well, don't let the door hit you, you know, where the good word is split. And and there, you know, there, there there's some coaches who will give more, more leeway on that front. But I know that Steve Sarkeesian, for instance, is not one of them. Did you see his quote? I think it was a few weeks or, or months ago, but he said that um, he was on he was on the record on on a show or a podcast, not that different than this one, I imagine. And he basically said, "Yeah, if if you go into the portal, there will be none of oh, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming there will back, be none no. of this yeah, coming yeah, back out of the portal. If you go in, that means you are not one hundred percent committed to being at Texas. And I don't care if you're eighty percent in." I don't care if you're 50%. I'm, I'm, I'm not having it. Once you're in, you're gone. You're done. Have, you know, have a great... And he was very, very blunt and direct about it. Do you think that's the opinion or kind of the feeling of a lot of coaches? Pretty much. The, now, you got to also remember, Steve is coaching Texas. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. I'm just going to leave it at that. If people out there don't know what that means, that means they don't follow recruiting enough. 
a dead a dead dog can recruit to Texas. So it's not that hard. So he just go get get another four or five star kid. Bye bye. That's it. Yeah, and that, that, that's that's perks of being at a, at a at a program like that. That question came in from Mike, by the way. Keep them coming, and we will keep the segments coming with Brian Smith, our locked on recruiting insider at FB Scout underscore Florida on Twitter. Brian, thank you as always. Thank you, sir. Have a good one, brother. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.